Hello friends, this is Jim here with uh, Science Talk. And in the uh, second video in my series of oscillations, I want to discuss with you, and I'll do this in one video, the IPO and the PDO, the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. All right, we're going to tackle the IPO first. So uh, the IPO is a large-scale, long-period oscillation that influences climate variability over the Pacific Basin. The IPO operates at a multi-decadal scale with phases lasting around 20 to 30 years. During the positive phase of the IPO, precipitation is generally higher than normal northeast of the South Pacific, converge of the South Pacific Convergence Zone and lower than normal southwest of the South Pacific Convergence Zone. I'll explain what the SPCZ is in a moment. Mean sea level pressures are higher than normal to the west of the dateline and lower than normal to the east of the dateline. Due to these pressure differences, which are the result of differing sea heights, there's a southerly flow anomaly during the positive phase of the IPO. It is a cycle that is about three to four times longer than a typical ENSO cycle. Main parameters are sea surface temperature and sea surface height. That's what SSH stands for. So now if I can just uh, get myself to reappear here for a moment. I guess I'm not going to reappear. All right, well, let's see if I can uh, explain. You know, I, I tried to do this in the ENSO video, but when you have water piled up, and let's assume that you have a flat basin, a flat bottom. If I have water that's piled up higher on one end so that the, the height of the water is taller, well, if I look at the pressure exerted on the bottom vertically down, the water that is piled taller will exert a greater pressure on the bottom than water that's at another location that's not as tall. Right? Well, water is now going to follow the pressure gradient. It's going to go from high to low, and water will flow down this sort of quote-unquote hill of water, and it will move from where it's piled higher to where it's piled lower. Now, with ENSO, of course, you have winds pushing it, but if the winds relax, like during El Nino, then all that warm water moves to the east, as we saw in that uh, previous video. So that's kind of what they're getting at here when they're talking about the sea level pressures. Okay, the South Pacific Convergence Zone is a reverse-oriented monsoon trough. It's a band of low-level convergence, cloudiness, and precipitation extending from the Western Pacific warm pool at the maritime continent southeastward towards the French Polynesia as far as the Cook Island, 106 degrees west, 20 degrees south. The SPCZ is a portion of the intertropical convergence zone called the ITCZ, which lies in a band extending east to west near the equator but can be more extra tropical in nature, in other words, away from the tropics, especially east of the international dateline. It's considered the largest and most important piece of the ITCZ and has the least dependence upon heating from the nearby landmass during the summer than any other portion of the monsoon trough. The SPCZ can affect the precipitation on Polynesian islands in the Southwest Pacific Ocean, so it is important to understand how the SPCZ behaves with large-scale global climate phenomena such as the ITCZ, ENSO, and the IPO is a portion, IPO is a portion of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. The ITCZ is part of the IPO and the IPO is part of the PDO. Okay. I should have capitalized the D and the O there, oh well. <laughs> Research into SPCZ movements of the 20th century are linked to changes in the IPO and the ENSO. For example, Fallen et al. In 2002, defined an index to describe the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation with sea surface temperature and night marine air temperature to determine how the SPCZ varies with the IPO. 
When the IPO index has negative temperature anomalies, the SPCZ is displaced southwest, and then it moves northeastward when the IPO index has positive temperature anomalies. So basically, IPO negative, it's, it goes towards the uh, southwest. IPO positive, it goes towards the northeast. The Southern Oscillation Index is a metric for describing warm and cold phase conditions associated with ENSO and can also describe movements of the position of the SPCZ. Negative SOI index values are associated with warm phase or El Nino-like conditions and a northeastward displacement of the SPCZ. Positive SOI index values, on the other hand, describe cold phase or La Nina and a southwestward displacement of the SPCZ. Basically, this is all tied together. So the IPO and the ENSO can interact together to produce changes in the position of the SPCZ. IPO, PDO, and ENSO will all ultimately interact together. West of about 140 west, both ENSO, measured the SOI, and IPO strongly influence the SPCZ latitude, but farther east only ENSO is a significant factor. Okay. So, here is the SPCZ, is Fiji, right? And here's the ITCZ. The ITCZ is in this narrow band where you see like the purple and the red. Now, convergence zone is where waters come meet together. They kind of pile into each other. So they pile up here, which means that's a conservation of volume. It has to go elsewhere. So when it, when it converges here, when it meets up here in this narrow band, it's either going to flow laterally out this way or will flow it'll go vertically downward. And same thing here. So we, wherever you see this I don't know what, magenta fuchsia color with the red and oranges, that is indicating some sort of a convergence zone. So you can see the SPCZ is a small part of the ITCZ. It is this that will move back and forth. It will move to the southwest, during like a La Nina and to the northeast during an El Nino because the warm water is moving in that way. So it's taking it with it. Now the salinity front, okay, so here's Muria. The salinity front, if you look at these values, I don't know how clear they are. This 34.4, it's like 35.2, and we get to 36. So you can see the salinity. Right here we have a strong, this is a horizontal gradient. We have a strong, strong front right here where we have a slightly lesser salinity here, and we have greater salinity here and even greater salinity here. Why the difference in the salinity? A lot of it is evaporation. You evaporate some of the water, you leave the salt behind. Just like brine rejection. You, all right, you freeze the water, but you leave the salt behind. So you make the liquid portion of the water uh, denser because of higher salinity well you get this strong gradient in salinity because of evaporation and so you're going to get differences in density as well but i wanted to include this here so you can see where the south pacific convergence zone and the intertropical convergence zones are intertropical right you can see it's in between the tropics so now you know where they're located and uh, this this description refers to that diagram, and this is from Lindsley et al. in 2006, shows the annual average precipitation in the uh, top panel, okay? And uh, warmer colors indicate increased precipitation or salinity. Colder colors indicate decreased precipitation or salinity. The salinity front, which is a function of the SPCZ, is indicated in the bottom panel. So you know, more, uh, more precipitation, less precipitation, etc. Now, here is an IPO index based on power at all 1999, looking at sea surface temperature anomalies. And you can see it goes from 1900 to about 2008. And there is some sort of a cycle to it. There is a cycle, and uh, as you can see, it stretches over uh, some decades, but uh, there it is. 
So that's an example of the IPO index. And then the interdecadal IPO is in red. And then here is another calculation based on other uh, parameters, uh, the trended Pacific uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, meaning that they looked at it individually. They did not do like running, uh, smoothing averages, that kind of stuff. And as you can see, the data set pretty much agree. And it's the same time period, 1900 to 2008. And you can, you can kind of get a, 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 an appreciation for the decadal uh, cyclical nature of this. And then this is just a very nice smoothing. This is obviously positive phase, and this is negative phase. And this is from uh, tierra.government.new Zealand, NZ is for New Zealand. So they, prov they did provided this uh, graphic. And the IPO, and what this is interesting is they're looking at the temperature anomaly from zero, which is mean none, up to 0 0.6, 0 0.6. And as the cycles around, they fit a regression line through here. And the trend is 0 0.16 degrees C per decade increase. In other words, the temperature anomaly is increasing, which reflects the warming surface waters of the ocean. So, is there not much to the uh, IPO? The PDO is the big boy. That, uh, so, in my view, there's, there are some who, who treat them differently, others consider the IPO part of the larger PDO, I fall in that camp. The PDO is a long-lived El Nino-like pattern of Pacific climate variability. And before I go further, the IPO is really restricted to um, basically right around the equator, plus or minus 5 degrees, but 10 degrees, right around the equator. The PDO is kind of the, almost the rest of the Pacific or at least the North Pacific Basin. While the two climate oscillations have similar spatial climate fingerprint, they have very different behavior in time. Okay? Now, that what they're saying, they're talking about El Nino and, and the PDO, not IPO. So, so the, the two climate oscillations, that is El Nino and PDO, and so in the PDO, have similar spatial climate fingerprints. In other words, looking at the sea surface temperature, and other parameters that are considered with very different behavior and time. Basically, what they're saying is, we, as discussed earlier, ENSO has periods of 6 to 24 months for an El Nino, La Nina to last, and the cycle is typically around 5 to 7, maybe up to 10 years, whereas the decadal oscillation, as named decadal suggests, is on the order of you know, 15 to 20 or 30 years. So it's much longer lived. Fishery scientist Stephen Hare coined the term Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It was recognized early on and was at first called the Lunar Nodal Cycle, we used to call it Lunar Noodle, and was thought to be on the order of about 18.6 years. In 1996, while researching connections between Alaska salmon production cycle and Pacific climate, that was his dissertation topic, two main characteristics distinguished the PDO from ENSO. First 20th century PDO events persisted for 20 to 30 years, similar to the IPO, <coughs> excuse me, while typical ENSO events persisted 6 to 18 months. Second, the climatic fingerprints of PDO are most visible in the North Pacific North American sector, while secondary signatures exist in the tropics. Opposite is true for ENSO, but they are interrelated, as I will show you coming up. Several independent studies find evidence for just two full PDO cycles in the past century. Cool PDO regimes prevailed from 1890 to 1924, again from 1947 to 1976, while warm uh, PDO regimes dominate from 1925 to 46 and from 77 through at least the mid 1990s. However, we're, recent evidence indicating that we're now coming out of a cold or a cool PDO regime that lasted to up about like a year or two ago. That's new information. Right? 
Uh, Shoshiro Minobi has shown that 20th century PDO fluctuation were most energetic in two general periodicities, one from 15 to 25 years and the other from 50 to 70 years. Yeeha. Another URL for you to uh, check out. Major changes in Northeast Pacific marine ecosystems have been correlated with phase changes in the PDO. Warm eras have been have seen enhanced coastal ocean biological productivity in Alaska, but inhibited productivity off the west coast of the contiguous U.S., while cold PDO eras have seen the opposite north-south pattern of the marine ecosystem. So warm eras, Alaska enjoys increased biological pro productivity. West coast of the U.S., not so. Cold PDO, it's the reverse. So the uh, PDO is, index is defined as the leading principal component of North Pacific monthly sea surface temperature variability, and it's poleward of 20 north degrees. In other words, from 20 degrees north latitude towards basically the Bering Strait. <laughs> PDO's robust recurring pattern of ocean atmosphere climate variability centered over the mid-latitude Pacific Basin. It's detected as warm or cool surface waters in the Pacific Ocean north of 20 north. Over the past century, the amplitude of this climate pattern has varied irregularly at interannual to interdecadal timescales, meaning time periods of a few years to as much as time periods of multiple decades. There is evidence of reversals in the prevailing polarity, meaning changes in cool surface waters versus warm surface waters within the region of the oscillation occurring around 1925, 47, 77. The last two reversals correspond to a dramatic shifts in salmon production regimes in the North Pacific Ocean. This climate pattern also affects coastal sea and continental surface air temperatures from Alaska to California. During warm or positive phase, the West Pacific becomes cooler. Notice as the Eastern Pacific warms up and part of the Eastern Ocean warmed during a cool or negative phase, the opposite occurs. And as mentioned earlier, Stephen R. Hare noticed it while stu studying salmon production pattern results in 97. Okay, here it is. So here's the PDO. This is the cool phase. Okay. And just to, okay, so cool is negative, warm is positive. So cool is negative, warm is positive. So this is negative. Okay, this is positive. You see how the temperature regimes literally are mirror images of each other. They flip. It's warm right, right running down the coast of North America during the warm phase. Cold, cool phase, we run, you know, it's cool water temperatures off the coast of North America. So that's the best, that's the easiest way to remember. If the water temperature is off North America, cool, it's in the cool phase or negative. If it's warm, it's in the warm phase or positive. It's the simplest way to remember it. Okay, so so there's the, what the PDO looks like from the sea surface temperature aspect. And uh, oceanic and atmospheric evidence for a for the PDO. And this is uh, from uh, Lagerlof, Commons, Polovina, and Mitchum are the uh, authors here. And they look at it from 67 to 2003. Here they indicate an El Nino event here in 97, 98, that strong El Nino. So the PDO cold face, okay, that's negative. You notice we have the negative signs up here, and then the warm phase is in red, and we have the positive sign. So warm phase is the PDO in a positive phase. Blue, cool the PDO, that's in the negative phase, and you see the, the signs accordingly. The Alaska Gyro Dynamic Height, that's this black line. And you can see it's very interesting how it closely tracks what the, uh, what the index is doing. Now, dynamic height refers to the Alaska Gyro is the counterclockwise gyro in the uh, Gulf of Alaska. It's an oceanic gyro, and the dynamic height is a reference to sea surface heights. And then the green is the satellite altimeter sea level. So below normal, above the normal. Basically what they're saying. So remember, let's go back here. OK. 
Okay, the cool phase, okay, we have cooler well, temperatures here, and the warm phase, we have warmer temperatures here. This will be the positive, and that's the negative. And so what they're showing is that the sea surface height is tracking very nicely with which phase it's, it's, it's in. Did I, uh, yes, okay. PDO, sea surface temperature index and surface height, EOF. So EOF is defined as the empirical orthogonal function and EOFI is the corresponding index. This is simply a statistical method to analyze the stuff. I am, this is very complicated. It's beyond the scope of what I want to do in this video. So if you're interested, you can always Google it or go it if yourself. But it's basically a statistical, uh, complicated statistical method to do some calculations. This graph is for the time period of 62 to 2003, after which a cooling phase was entered. Current data suggests that the PDO is now entering a warming phase. Okay. Um, let's say to about 2003, there was a brief excursion to a warming phase around 2003. Oops, went the wrong way which is this, okay, but quickly reverse and rejoin the overall cooling phase to start around 98 and ending around late 2018 with PDO entering a warming phase, which I alluded to a few moments ago. There was a moderate El Nino around this time. Whether this caused a brief warming is unclear, uncertain. So here's the PDO index, a little more time span, and again, a smoothing graphic of it, and you know, here was this brief 2003. Here was that brief warming. Then we went back in the cooling, a couple little uh, burps here. But overall, it was cooling. We're now coming out of the cooling phase into a warming phase. That's the latest data indicates. And this refers to this graphic. Monthly values for the PDO uh, I. Black line is 121 month smooth data source. That's basically 10 years. Right, so this is a smoothing. So that's why you see the graph starts there in 1910 or so, because you have to wait for the previous 10 years, and it stops here about 2005, 2006 or so, because you know we don't have when we get to data over here, then we can back calculate basically. But you can see the the cyclical nature of it. That's what this shows. It shows it very nicely, as a matter of fact. Okay, so monthly values of the PDOI kind of shows in a little cleaner uh, method. 2000 ends here. Again, you can see uh, you know a positive phase. So this is warming along the North America side with the sea surface temperatures, cooling along the North America side, and it's negative phase. Another graph going a little further. So from 1900 to uh, basically almost 2020, about 2018 or so. You can see those uh, major cooling uh, phases that I mentioned at the outset of this uh, video, along with the major warming phases as well. So here's the 15 to 30 year cycle approximately. Here's the positive PDO pattern. And you'll see what? Here's that cool blob along with warm temperatures off North America, and then the flip-flop. We see it's cooling down here, not as warm, and this water here has warmed up dramatically. Also, look at what's happening along the equator. Warmer water here, cooler water here. PDO index is spatial average of monthly sea surface temperature, so north of 20 degrees from here on up. The global average anomaly is subtracted to account for global warming. So this is accounting for global warming, highly correlated with the temperature in the California current, which is down this way. Now, here is what I wanted to show you. This, I just, uh, I think this is a really superb graphic. It kind of ties this in together, shows how ENSO and PDO, and remember, IPO I consider to be part of PDO, because IPO is, is along here, right? Here's where the IPO is. So 
the IPO is going to be influenced by ENSO and a PDO. So the warm phase, El Nino, of course, is the warm phase, the cold phase, right? La Nina is the cold phase. So positive and negative. Here's the warm water off uh, North America, cool waters off North America, the cold water here, and becomes the warm water here. They flip-flop, right? So we have this temperature here. Right? Look at this here. See how they're tied together? Another thing is look at the wind forcing. Right? These little arrows are wind vectors. Look at the wind forcing. They track closely together. So we, here we have a very strong El Nino. El Nino is tied into the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. When there's a warm PDO in the positive phase, you're going to have an El Nino. When you have a cold or negative phase in the PDO, you're going to have a La Nina because then the cool water, excuse me, the warm water gets pushed back to the west, leaving cooler water here. That's what we see here. And don't forget, tied in here, here's the Aleutian Islands. You have the Aleutian Low. The Aleutian Low gets pushed to the east when the, the Indonesian Low goes to the east. Right? The Indonesian Low goes to the east, it pushes the Aleutian Low to the east. Changes the flow patterns this way. Right? You'll see how the flow pattern is counterclockwise. Atmospheric here. Look at the arrows. That brings warmer conditions, maybe more precipitations into Alaska. But then when the Indonesian low moves to the west, it drags the Aleutian low back to the west. And now look at the, how the flow patterns change. You can see that. Look how the wind forcing changes. It, it shows it very clearly. Very, very nice. And also with this, you get that upwelling. The gyra is a little stronger here in the Gulf of Alaska. So you get that upwelling, bringing in nutrients. This is why it's tied in to salmon productivity. That salmon productivity did best during the positive phase when the waters off the coast were warmer. Because this is reaching right into Prince William Sound. And you get the reverse. So if there's any graphic that you take away from this uh, video, this is it right here. This, this shows the whole ench enchilada. Okay, several hypotheses for the mechanism of the PDO. Pre pre predictability is a little suspect, but, you know, as you... as Get more data, you know, get the understanding improved, so, so will this will improve. The mechanisms giving rise to PDO will determine whether skillful decades-long PDO climate predictions are possible. Okay, air-sea interactions that may be required 10-year ocean adjustment times and aspects of the phenomenon will be, in theory, predictable at lead times up to 10 years. Even without even if you had no theoretical understanding, PDO climate information improves season to season, year to year climate forecast for North America because of the strong tendency for multi season and multi year persistence. From a societal impacts perspective, recognition of PDO is important because it shows that quote unquote normal climate conditions can vary over time periods comparable to the length of a human lifetime. Several studies indicate a PDO index can be reconstructed as the superimposition of tropical forcing and extratropical processes. Thus, unlike ENSO, the PDO is not a single physical mode of ocean variability, but rather the sum of several processes with dynamic, different dynamic origins. In other words, it's a conglomeration, a whole bunch of things put together into the larger. So you can think of the PDO as greater than the sum of the parts. Into annual timescales, PDO index is thought of as some of random and ENSO induced variability in the Aleutian low. Whereas on decadal timescales, ENSO teleconnections, that refers to climate anomalies uh, being related to each other at large distances, typically thousands of kilometers. Stochastic, another fancy word for saying random, atmospheric forcing and changes in the North Pacific Oceanic gyro circulation contribute approximately equally. We haven't even talked about Milankovitch affecting all of this. But there's another couple of parameters to toss in there. Additionally, sea surface temperature anomalies have some winter to winter persistence 
due to the what's known as the re-emergence mechanism. And so can influence the global circulation pattern thousands of kilometers away from equatorial Pacific through the known as the atmospheric bridge, the atmospheric circulation cell, during El Nino events, deep convection and heat transfer to the troposphere, that's the lower portion of the atmosphere, is enhanced over the anomalously warm sea surface temperature. This ENSO-related tropical forcing generates ROSB waves that propagate poleward and eastward and are subsequently refracted back from the pole to the tropics. Okay, what are ROSB waves? They're planetary oceanic waves. I'm going to leave it at that. They're very complicated. Very, you also have Kelvin waves, which are also planetary and basin-wide waves. And the, this gets very, very complicated. And one of the jobs of physical oceanographers is to separate out the Rosby wave signal, or at least see how the Rosby wave signal influences things like sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface height, and uh, other parameters. So ENSO-driven patterns mod modify surface temperature, humidity, wind, distribution of clouds over the North Pacific that alter surface heat, momentum, basically uh, water momentum, and freshwater fluxes, and thus induce sea surface temperature, salinity, and mixed layer depth, MLD anomalies. The atmospheric bridge is more, more effective during boreal winter when the deep in Aleutian low results in stronger and cold northwesterly winds over the central Pacific and warm humid southerly flows along the North American West Coast. Low pressure systems in the northern hemisphere are anticyclonic, meaning that they flow in a counterclockwise direction. It's the reverse in the southern hemisphere. So you have the Aleutian Low, the counterclockwise flow out of the you know, out of the south brings warmer temperatures to northern North America. Conversely, that and at the same time, the northwesterly winds over the central Pacific bring in colder air down from the Arctic. So, uh, it, you know, along the west coast, the associated changes in seas and surface heat fluxes, and to a lesser extent, Ekman transport creates negative sea surface temperature anomalies and a deepened mixed layer depth. In the Central Pacific and warm the ocean from Hawaii to the Bering Sea. Ekman transport is a calculation that's done by integrating over the water column. And basically, when you have wind forcing, right, think of the westerlies pushing this, the water to from east to west. Okay. If that were not on the equator, if that was say mid-latitude, because of Coriolis. Is a deflection to the right that the mass transport would actually be to the right. So you propagate a a, a direction to the right. Something that's uh, when it's near a coast, we call it onshore Ekman transport. So that you actually have water moving along the coast, but because of the Coriolis, you get this deflection to the right. And it's actually when you integrate over the water column, it's the, the, the integral sum is the 90 degrees to the direction of the, of the original current. But there's the thing called the Ekman spiral, which as you go deeper in the water column, the amount of deflection decreases. So it gets less and less and less. Probably not doing a very good job of explaining uh, that, but this is very complicated uh, physical oceanography. And I would need a, a textbook with diagrams and and mathematics to show you how it really works. And I do know how this works. But it's very difficult to explain without having without the mathematics, to be quite honest. You need the mathematics to uh, explain this. But Ekman transport is basically, think of it as a net uh, mass transport of water. So here's an example of a teleconnection. Uh, We're showing the atmospheric uh, bridge. And you have a deep dilution low. You have a deep convection, so you know the you know warm air rising. It, it comes across, then wind, temperatures, moisture, everything changes, and then it, it uh, sinks as it cools. It sinks down, so you create this uh, connection here, and 
with and you have all these atmospheric cells that you can have the Pacific and the Atlantic communicating as well. But when we talk about uh, bridges and teleconnection over thousands of kilometers, here's kind of an ex a diagrammatic ex uh, example illustrating that. And that is a description of this figure. So Boreal went to sea surface temperature, sea level pressure contours, and the dashed line indicated indicative of negative anomalies. And this is a composite of nine El Nino events minus nine La Nina events. Here's the data source. So this is above normal, and this is below normal, and white is normal. Hawaiian Islands, by the way. So sea surface temperature, sea level pressure. That's the okay. What's wrong? Sea level pressure, contours, and dashed lines. So this this is temperature. These are the temperature. This is the pressure. The dashed lines. And then the, for the reemergence, mid latitude sea surface temp anomaly patterns tend to recur from one winter to the next, but not during the intervening summer. This is the, because of the strong mixed layer that occurs seasonally. The mixed layer depth over the North Pacific is deeper, typically 100 to 200 meters in winter than it is in summer, and thus sea surface temperature anomalies that form during winter and extend to the base of the mixed layer are sequestered beneath the shallow summer mixed layer when it reforms in late spring due to incoming solar energy, which forms surface waters more so, thus in essence creating a cap which, that's, which basically traps this water that extended down deep. So in essence, you're going to get a summer seasonal layer with a shallow picnocline thermocline in addition to the deeper picnocline thermocline. So, and, and that creates a little bit of an insulation from the air sea heat influx. When the mixed layer deepens again in the following autumn, early winter, the anomalies again influence the surface. And that's been called the reemergence uh, mechanism by Alexander and Desser, 1995 paper. Observed over much of the North Pacific Ocean, although it's more effective in the West, where the winter mixed layer is deeper and the seasonal cycle greater. Stochastic or random atmospheric forcing. Long-term sea surface temperature variation may be induced by random atmospheric forcings that are integrated and reddened, that means the infrared into the ocean mixed layer. The stochastic or random climate model paradigm was proposed by uh, Ryan Newell and Hasselman. In this model, a stochastic forcing represented by the passage of storms have altered the ocean mixed layer temperature via surface energy fluxes. Ekman currents and the system is damped due to enhanced reduced heat loss to the atmosphere over the anomalously warm cold or cold sea surface temperature via turbulent energy and long wave radiate, radiative fluxes. Basically, what they're saying is that you're going to have uh, the variations in sea surface temperature can be affected by uh, solar energy. It can be, uh, and this can uh, uh, change the, uh, the cross section, vertical cross section of the ocean mix layer. So you know, depending on what the temperatures are doing, depending on the, the density, you're going to get some uh, what's called energy fluxes. That's basically the movement of the water and ecman currents, movement of the water, and the system may be damped to re, uh, enhance or reduce heat loss to the atmosphere over the anomalously warm or cold sea surface temperature via turbulent energy. Uh, that means mixing. You know, what is the mixing regime doing? Is it intense or not? If it's intense, well, that's going to enhance the transfer of energy. If it's not, it's not. Then the energy transfer is reduced. That's basically all that is saying. Several dynamic oceanic mechanisms, sea surface uh, temperature air feedback may contribute to the observed decadal variability in North Pacific Ocean. SAT variability is stronger in the Kuroshio Oyashio extension, known as the KOE region, and is associated with changes in the KOE axis and strength. The KOE, the Kuroshio Oyashio, are the currents 
that are in the Western Pacific and basically, you know, runs past the, uh, the island of Japan, you know, that section of the Pacific. So that's where we're located here. And this, and this may generate the decadal and longer time scales uh, SST variants, but without the observed magnitude of the spectral peak, that's basically where a sig spectral peak, in other words, where they, a signal was calculated or was observed about 10 years and the SST air feedback. Remote reemergence occurs in regions of strong currents, such as the Kuroshio extension, and anomalies created near Japan may reemerge next winter. Okay. Reemergence occurring in strong current. That's that energy transfer that was talking about in this paragraph here, helping the reemergence of right, mid latitude SST, etc. Effective resonance, Sarah Vanan and McWilliams in 1998 demonstrated that the interaction between spatially coherent atmospheric forcing pattern and an, an advective ocean shows periodicities at preferred time scale when non-local advective effects dominate over the local sea surface temperature damping. This advective resonance mechanism may generate decadal SST variability in the eastern North Pacific associated with the anomalous Ekman advection and surface heat flux. Okay, what, that's a mouthful. What they're basically saying is atmospheric oceanic interactions are going to affect what kind of sea surface temperatures taking place, whether it's going to be dampened, in other words, uh, suppressed, okay? Advective resonance. Resonance refers to a frequency. So, um, advective referring to advection, like, uh, the, you know, the movement. Think of advective as sort of like a, a diffusion process. You can think of it that way. And these taken together may generate the, the variability in sea surface temperatures over decades, but this will be affected by any changes in the Ekman transport and any changes in the surface heat flux. What, it, what you need to get from all of this and, is that there are so many parameters that are interplayed here and they affect each other and are all intertwined and tied together so that a little change over here can generate a, a much different response, you know, when you grind out all the calculation. So any subtle changes can, can uh, manifest itself in a larger response. That's kind of what all these the last few uh, paragraphs are indicating. Dynamic gyro adjustments are essential to generate the Cato SST peaks in the North Pacific process occurs via westward propagating oceanic Rossby waves, which are planetary waves usually propagate, propagate along pycnocline, thermocline. So they're kind of like a, an in, what's called an internal wave, travels across the ocean and reflects when reaching land boundaries. Think of uh, the old in, uh, high school physics, right? You had the springs, the slinky, and you, and you had the two fixed ends there, and you released it. And you watched the wave travel, then it hit the other end. It did what? It reflected and came back. Now what Rosby waves are doing, and they are forced by wind anomalies in the Central Pacific, Eastern uh, uh, Pacific, Central and Eastern Pacific. Okay, think about the trade winds and the westerlies and the easterlies and so on. The quasi-geostrophic equation, when Coriolis effect and horizontal pressure gradient are almost in balance. Not quite, but almost, is what helps establish gyres for long, non-dispersive Rossby waves forced by large-scale wind stress. That's the shear stress exerted by wind on the surface of large bodies of water, such as oceans. It is a force that is parallel to the surface. So the wind stress, when the wind blows over the water, it's pushing on the water parallel to the surface and in the same direction that the wind is moving. Quasi-geostrophic uh, equation. Coriolis effect and horizontal pressure gradient are almost in balance. Okay, I've given you pieces of this before. Go back to my example of a higher, a water column that's higher at one end, we'll assume a flat bottom, and lower at the other end. So 
you have where it's higher, where the water's taller, it has exerts more pressure downward for it than where it's not as tall. So it's going to want to follow that pressure gradient, and it's going to flow from the taller region to the to the shorter region. That's the horizontal pressure gradient. So it's going to flow down that. Now, if you're off the equator, the, or the Coriolis effect is the deflection, and it's not a, it used to be called the Coriolis force, it's an effect. It is due to the Earth's rotation with an apparent deflection. And that apparent deflection is to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. You have that flow going from high to low, and then it deflects. But because of Ekman transport, let's let's go with a uh, what we find in typical uh, oceanic gyras. So if I have a high mound of water in the middle of something, the pressure is higher. There. The water is going to flow out outward from that. Let's go and we're in the northern hemisphere. It's going to flow outward from that. So it flows down the horizontal pressure gradient from the taller water to the sh shorter water. Coriolis now takes that movement and bends it to the right. Now, if we're in the northern hemisphere and we're going outward from a high low uh, from a high region, that movement cr creates a clockwise gyra. Okay. Well, now what happens? Ekman transport is going to take that water that's now flowing down here and push it back to the center making the water higher again in the center, and then it's gonna flow down the horizontal pressure gradient again, and, it, and then this way, this is how the gyros are perpetuated. That's what this is saying. Now, quasi-geostrophic equation base is a way to calculate all of this. But you have uh, the, the simplest way to think of it, you have water piled up in the center, water's taller there, so it's going to it's a great, exerts greater pressure, so it's going to flow from the greater pressure to the lesser pressure, which is where the water is, is shorter. And as it does so, Coriolis moves it to the right, northern hemisphere. But as it's moving it to the right, we also have Ekman transport, which is pushing the water back towards the center, repiling it up in the center. And it keeps this motion going of a gyra. That is what happens. And this typically happens in the middle of the North Atlantic, this, the South Atlantic, the North Pacific, the South Pacific. You have gyros. And because the gyros tend to, we have the water, the Ekman transport is pushing the water back to the center. The center is known as a convergence zone. So the water is converging there. Well, in addition to water flowing outward horizontally, there's also some downwelling in the center. In the southern hemisphere, the deflection is to the left, but you get the same effect. You're still going to push the Ekman transport to the left, repiling the water up. So in the northern hemisphere, they are clockwise in direction. Southern hemisphere, they are counterclockwise, but the result is the same. Convergence zones in the center with downwellings in the center and low biological productivity. The reverse is true. If you have water that's higher in the surrounding region that, and it's lower in the middle, the water is going to flow inwards, be deflected to the right, northern hemisphere. And then, so as it's being deflected uh, to the right, so it's flowing in with deflecting to the right, it sets up a what? Counterclockwise flow in the northern hemisphere. And uh, Ekman transport is now going to push the water away from the center out to the periphery, where again, you get the high horizontal pressure gradient, shoving it back down to the center, perpetuating the gyra. So in addition, again, in addition to the outward horizontal flow of the water following uh, the pressure gradient, you now create, uh, when you push the water away from the center, you create a void in the middle, and then you have an upwelling in the middle, and upwellings bring nutrients. This is why the Gulf of Alaska, which is a counterclockwise gyra, is productive. So, and what's really nice is 
Um, you can actually show this mathematically by calculating what's called the curl. And the curl is basically vector multiplication. And uh, it's fun to do if you, if you like vector calculus like I do. And, uh, but it mathematically demonstrates very nicely, very nicely uh, what's happening. So that's basically what, you know, that's an explanation of that, those couple of sentences there. Okay, what about temperature and precipitation impacts? PDO spatial pattern impacts are similar to those associated with ENSO. During the positive phase, the elution low is deepened and shifted southward, allowing warm, humid air, and also eastward, by the way, along the North Pacific coast, and temperatures are higher than usual from North Pacific Northwest to Alaska, but below normal in Mexico and the southeastern U.S. Winter precipitation is higher than usual in the Alaska coast range, Mexico and the southwestern U.S., but reduced over Canada, eastern Siberia, and Australia. Okay. McCabe et al. in 2004 showed that PDO, along with the AMO, which is the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, strongly influenced multidecadal drought patterns in the U.S., Drought frequencies enhance over much of the northern U.S. during positive PDO phase and over the southwest U.S. during the negative PDO phase. In both cases, if the PDO is associated with a positive AMO. Once again, everything is tied together. The Asian monsoon is also affected. Increased rainfall, decreased summer temperature is observed over the Indian subcontinent during negative phase. So here is temperature anomalies. As you see, it's warmer, okay. cooler here. These are temperature anomaly and cooler here, a little warmer here, but definitely very strongly warmer here. Okay. And both of these are referring to what's happening during the positive phase. Okay. It's warmer, and uh, then as this will show, you get somewhat higher, uh, let's see, this precipitation anomaly, it's higher in here, a little, a little low on the coast here, but it's higher here, higher here, lower here, and, and so on. So, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, that's negative. So that means this is millimeters per day. So that means this is going to be drier. So, okay, so it's going to be drier. So this is not drier. This is wetter. And it reverses scale on me. Yes, it is. Look, they reverse the scale. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's what they did. Sorry for that. I'm so used to seeing this being above average and that being below average. So yeah, we're seeing wetter conditions here, drier conditions here, here, and here. That's what this is showing. We have drier conditions where you see this brownish uh, indicators and bluish is wetter. But here with the temperature anomaly, this is warmer and the blue is cooler. So it's warmer and wetter in the Northwest Pacific and Alaska. And then you can see what happens in, say, South America. And look at Australia, it's drier. And as you can see, a little warmer, not intensely warm, it's a little warmer, almost average. That's what's going on there during the uh, positive phase. They use it a flip-flop during the negative phase. So here's a summation. PDO indicators, temperature, precipitation, positive and negative. So Pacific Northwest, BC, Alaska. Okay, temperature is above average. Okay, below average in the negative phase. Mexico, Southeast US, below average, above average. Precipitation, Alaska Coast Range, above average. That's that blue, right, so it's above average. Below average in the negative phase. Mexico, southwestern, U.S., above average, and then it flips. So you can see that the positive and negative, they're exact flip-flops of whatever is here, the exact opposite is in the other column. And then the summer monsoon. Canada, eastern Siberia, Australia. Okay. Precipitation is below average, and then the negative phase is above average. That's a summation of what's happening with the PDO, how it's affecting the conditions uh, in whatever region you may be. 
And the PDO index has been reconstructed using tree rings and other hydrologically sensitive proxies from West North America and Asia. McDonald and Case in 05 reconstructed PDO back to 993 using tree rings from California and Alberta. The index shows a 50 to 70 year periodicity, but is a strong mode of variability only after 1800. A persistent negative phase occurred during the medieval times, 993 to 1300, which is consistent with La Nina condition reconstructed in the tropical Pacific and multi-century drought in the Southwest US. Several regime shifts are apparent both in reconstructions and instrumental data. During the 20th century, regime shifts associated with concurrent changes in SST and SLP, which is uh, basically land precipitation. Sea land precipitation. It's kind of a combination there. And then ocean cover, cloud cover occurred in 24, 25, 45, 46, 76, 77. So here are some summaries of the PDO through time. 1750, unusually strong oscillation. PDO changed to a warm phase, 45, 46, changed to a cool phase. Similar to the 70s episode, but with a greater signature near Japan. 76, 77, back to a warm phase. 88, 89, weakening evolution low associated with SST changes observed. The change appears to be related to concurrent extratropical oscillation in the North Pacific and North Atlantic rather than tropical processes. In other words, the PDO was more pr uh, prominent than the IPO or perhaps ENSO. 9798, this is a strong El Nino. Several changes in sea surface temperature and marine ecosystem occurred in the North Pacific. In contrast, to prevailing anomalies observed after the 70s shift, the SST declined along the U.S. West Coast. Substantial changes in the population of salmon, anchovy, sardines were observed as the PDO changed back to a cool anchovy phase because that favors anchovies. However, the spatial pattern of the SST change was different with a meridional SST seesaw in the Central and Western Pacific. Seesaw oscillating that resembled a strong shift in the North Pacific gyro oscillation rather than the PDO structure. So this is an interesting thing. Basically they're saying that the changes in how the specific North Pacific gyro was behaving was more influential than any changes in the PDO structure. The 2014 flip from the cool to the warm phase, which vaguely resembled a long and drawn El Nino event, contributed to record-breaking surface temperatures across the planet in 2014. So now it's the other question, okay? Yes, when they do the indices, they separate out global warming signal, but now, now you want to reincorporate that signal to see how things will be affected. So here's the PDO index, and going back to 993, all the way up to the present. So this is that little signal, you know, that I showed you earlier. So this goes back basically a millennia. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind the errors associated with such measurements. And that's uh, the data source and an explanation of that. NOAA produces official ENSO forecasts, experimental statistical forecasts using linear inverse modeling, no statistical method, to predict the PDO. Linear inverse modeling assumes the PDO can be separated into a linear deterministic component and a nonlinear component represented by random fluctuations. Much of the LIM PDO predict predictability arises from ENSO and the global trend rather than extratropical processes and is thus limited to about four seasons. The prediction is consistent with the seasonal footprinting mechanism, which an optimal SST structure evolves into the ENSO mature phase six to 10 months later. Now the strong El Nino signal. The subsequent subsequently impacts the North Pacific SST via the atmospheric bridge. Obviously a lot of area of work to improve the modeling and the predictability of such an adventure. Related patterns and a little bit of summary. The IPO is similar but less localized phenomenon. It covers the southern hemisphere as well. Okay, this is interdecadal Pacific oscillation. Okay, um, as opposed to the tropical. 
and it's at 50 s to 50 north and so tends to lead pdo cycling that's important shifts in the ipo change the location strength of enso the south Con uh, pacific conversion zone moves northeast and southwest right i covered that in my enso video and fallen at all 2002. same movement takes place during positive ipo negative ipo phases Interdecadal temperature variations in China are closely related to those of the NAO and the NPO. And the amplitude of the NAO and the North Pacific Oscillation increase in the 60s annual, uh, into annual variation patterns from three to four years, eight to 15 years. Sea level rise is affected when large areas of, warm wa of water warm and expand or cool and contract in addition to wind forcing as well, piling up the water or leaving water, uh, voids of water behind. So uh, a brief word about the NPO. It's a teleconnection pattern first described by Walker, okay, as characterized by its north-south sea saw and sea level pressure over the North Pacific. Okay, so the, 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 I've been talking about the PDO, Pacific Decadal. This is now the North Pacific Oscillation. Rogers using surface temperature, atmosphere temperature from St. Paul, Alaska, which is out on the uh, basically the Yukon Delta Flats, as well as Edmonton in uh, Canada, identified two phases of the NPO and Aleutian below phase that correspond to a deepened and eastward shifted Aleutian low and Aleutian above phase that is the opposite during the the uh, ABO phase, sea level pressure is enhanced over a large region in the subtropics that extend poleward to 40 north and reduce at higher latitudes. Westerlies are enhanced over the central Pacific and winter temperatures are mild along much of the North American West Coast, but cooler than usual over eastern Siberia and the U.S. Southwest. Precipitations are higher than usual over Alaska and the Great Plains. So that's just a quick word about uh, the North Pacific Oscillation. Basically, the NPO, the PDO, the IPO, and so they're all tied together. And we're seeing these flip back and forth that changes the, the temperature, the weather patterns, the precipitation. But now, as I discussed in the ENSO video, with global warming, we're seeing more of an ENSO condition, which means that, since, as I showed you earlier, in this uh, graphic here, when you have the positive phase of the PDO, it ties in with a, a, an El Nino, and then the reverse here, and I. In my ENSO video, I showed you what happens to precipitation patterns. And I'm showing you basically what's happening with, uh, with the PDO and the changes in temperature. And you can see the changes in the wind. You get the changes in the uh, precipitation patterns as uh, illustrated. You know, here, this is with a, a, a positive PDO. We see warmer than usual temperatures. And along with that, higher than usual precipitation patterns as well. And then the reverse is true as summed up in this little table as to what's going on in terms of temperature and precipitation in the various regions with the PDO positive or negative phase. So yes, there's a lot of technical stuff in here. And uh, you know, unless I was to do an online, uh, let's see if I can get my, Myself back here. So I peer back in here. I guess I'm being shy. I'm not, uh, yeah, 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 shut up. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm not reappearing here. Okay. But I want to, okay, you don't have to see me anyway. Um, the software did some changes to me. I'm still trying to figure out the changes. <laughs> so, but basically, the point is when, when you hear all these things about, you know, Ekman transport and Rosby waves and, you know, quasi-geostrophic equation, all this stuff, 
it's just, it's the physical system. It's all part, it's all part, this is all part of physics and fluid dynamics is what this is all about. And when you got, and then you have the ocean and the air coupled together. And that creates things. So you got low pressure and high pressure systems in the in the atmosphere moving about. Well, that's going to affect what happens precipitation wise. It's going to happen with effects with, with the uh, air water interface. Then you have wind, and that of course generates wind. Winds are going to affect the uh, uh, the water. And then you're gonna then you have solar radiation. You have you know we're going to have warmer water here, a cooler water here. What have everything is interconnected. And now we're seeing that all these little differently identified oscillations are actually all tied together. And as I continue with this series, when I, the next video will be about the IOD, then I'll do ones on the Atlantic side, the AMO and the NAO and the Arctic Oscillation. What I'm hoping at the end of this series is that you get an appreciation how it really is one huge global system. Yes, we can tease out little bits of it. Yes, we can, you know, find this signal and that signal and show how this is connected and maybe slightly disjointed. But all together, it's one big planetary system. And, and that's thanks to the teleconnections, you know, where you can have atmospheric cells communicating from one ocean basin to the other. And therefore, one, one drives the other. All these systems are driving each other. That one big planetary system. So uh, that will conclude my uh, my comment here on the IPO and PDO. Hope you found this informative, and uh, thank you for your time. And we continue on next with the IOD, which is the Indian Ocean Dipole. So stay tuned. Until then, thank you. Hey, folks, this is Jim here reminding you to please subscribe to my channel and please share my videos with others. Also, remember to click the bell so that you know when I drop in a new video. I also ask that you please consider becoming a patron of my channel and support the work that I do by going to patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa, each word separated by an underscore, and becoming a patron. It's asking for as little as three dollars a month, cost of a cup of coffee, to support the work I do and keep my informative videos coming your way. Thank you, thank you for your support.